Hi, I'm Eric Skinner. I'm uh, Vice President of Market Strategy at Trend Micro, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Chai Pinamnani, uh, the CTO of Sandstone. And we're uh, going to chat a little bit about what goes on with respect to risk assessment in Sandstone. So Chai, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about Sandstone? Thanks, Eric, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you about security. There's never a dull moment in those conversations. Uh, hi, I'm Ch Chaitanya Pinamneni, CTO for Sandstone Technology. Uh, it's a fintech organization that's been building uh, banking and financial products for financial customers for over two decades in Australia and UK market. And we primarily work around the banks and solutions around the lending and digital banking and providing customer interfaces for the banks to service their clients. So as you can see, it's a heavily regulated industry and it's a lot of fun innovating in this space nowadays. Sounds like it. And uh, certainly lots of, uh, lots of attackers are out there who are interested in uh, what potential uh, target you might be. So it, you've, you've been going through a fairly substantial transition to the cloud. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, Eric. It's as everyone finds out during their journey, and we did so, that uh, uh, the slowest speed uh, of the team is the one that holds back your innovation. And for us, it worked out to be the computing space and how we move about with the cloud. Uh, and in 2018, we made the decision to go fully cloud native and build our platform on AWS. And, and one of the reasons we chose cloud versus doing on-prem was so we can focus our energy on doing things we do best, which is building the products and providing our customers with a service while letting the partners do the heavy lifting. And it's been a, a challenging journey, but also very rewarding. All the initial roadblocks that people had, primarily because it was a new technology, the risk was not properly assessed, and there were not that many examples in the world. I'm happy to report back to say all those objections have gone for, away. Uh, people see the value, and we're moving heavily into the zero trust model. And I'm happy to say that we are seeing the benefits of it as of today in managing our risk, in managing our pipeline of work, and being able to innovate at a really fast speed. So when you think about the the combination of cloud assets now that you've got, as well as uh, some of the uh, the existing on-premise assets that haven't yet migrated or not going to be migrated, how have you dealt with the challenge of, first of all, just getting visibility over what assets you have? Uh, it's an interesting challenge, Eric, and if you don't mind, I would like to put an analogy that we use in the software world between uh, the servers being pets and cattles. Uh, so the on-prem on uh, servers, we treat them as pets. We name them, we look after them, and when you get sick, you know, uh, the doctors or the engineers go and make everything they do to bring them back to life. That means you have limited numbers, you, you know them, or you think you know them, <laughs> at least that's what I would say. Uh, and then you go to cloud where it's more like a, a cattle ranch where cattle come and go, they're, they're like a business, the hundreds of them are at any point of time. Mm -hmm. And that's where what we found was the traditional methods of looking after your inventory and how you record what you have and where the current status is do not work for cloud because it's a complete paradigm shift from thinking about naming your service to more managing them. And you, you need better tooling to be able to articulate how do you label them, where the state is, which condition they are in, what kind of a data they hold. So what we found was the challenge was, how do you manage all these assets out there in the cloud, could be anywhere in any country location where you put a VPC in, but at the same time, how do you leverage the power of it? Because knowing your assets will give you the right amount of risk management techniques to say which way you focus. And what we found the challenge was moving from the traditional methodologies to adopting to what cloud recommends. And that's where our most friction was, you know, giving up old technologies and old ways of doing, convincing all the departments, saying this is the new way of doing things, getting all the other parties other than my engineering team, which was ready to change its processes, but convincing all the other parties to come on this journey and adopt this new way of managing your assets in the cloud. So I would say it's been very hard to do that, but once we had implemented uh, all the required technologies and labeling and very good practices using infrastructure as code, I can say that we have full visibility in cloud. And in fact, I would go further to say, if you do not have 100% visibility in cloud, you're not doing it right. You, you cannot be without 100% visibility in cloud. That, that's as simple as it goes. 
And yet you would probably guess that a lot of organizations out there are, are not yet at the level of visibility that you've achieved. I, I would think so, Eric. Anyone who's yeah. sticking to traditional methods and technologies and still treating the servers as pet is eventually going to run into the human problem is you can only remember so much, you can make mistakes. And if you have things being recorded, they will never reflect the current state. So I uh, agree with that. And, and I believe most organizations are now realizing that as your number of digital assets grow up in the cloud, you need new technologies and partners to help you manage and understand the risk around them. That's right. So let's, um, let's chat a little bit about risk now. Uh, first of all, one, one of the risks would be you don't even know what assets you've got, but we've covered that. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that people like to understand is, is vulnerabilities across their environment, vulnerability assessment, which can, which can be very noisy and very overwhelming. What, what, what's been your experience with respect to getting a grip on vulnerabilities in, in your hybrid environment? Well, it's it's an interesting topic, uh, Eric, which have we, I feel in the last few years, we've gone from not caring or to almost caring to panicking now. Uh, with the number of vulnerabilities that are coming out right, left and center from all the major technology vendors, and most of them CVE ratings are pretty high, means we, found, we are finding the directors of the company, the executives are quite rightly concerned, and so are the customers. And it's an unending barrage of things being thrown at the cybersecurity and the engineers to say, how does this affect you? And of course, it's a complicated issue for the one simple thing. A vulnerability has a lot of other characteristics that defines how it affects you. And that's the context that's really important, whether you apply the context from an engineering perspective or exploitation, uh, the scope availability, or the simple fact that attack vector, whether it's applicable to you or not. Uh, what we're finding with that is that now you do need some uh, expertise in this area to understand the world, the engineering concepts, and to be able to then use all of this to make a realistic assessment. The reason being those days of fixing every vulnerability in the short period of time is gone. Now, all we are doing is managing the really high ones that does affect us, prioritizing them, while the other ones, uh, more of the things that don't really affect you, but it still is available in your stack, we're taking an approach of more, either we're redesigning that vulnerability out of the stack, or we're taking an approach of upgrading libraries over a period of time, rather than rushing into. So the experience has been managing stakeholders, communicating with customers, but most importantly, really understanding how the vulnerability affects you, so you can prioritize how you're going to fix it. Right, and, and that prioritization concept is becoming so important, uh, not only in the context of vulnerabilities, but just assessing risk even more broadly. When, when, when you are trying to get a, a, a sense of uh, the, the risks in your environment, vulnerabilities, uh, lack of visibility, uh, threats in the environment, and so on, how, how do you synthesize all of that? And do you have to do a lot of manual work? Uh, currently, yes, uh, but we are, I, I would sometimes say, uh, we meditate. <laughs> we, we literally meditate to try and make sense of this chaos. And when I say meditate, is it's a joint cybersecurity team exercise we have built. Uh, what we do is on a regular basis, we meet together with calm minds, with no panic. And we do these times when there's no active vulnerability, so we can actually talk about how things are. And each part of the partner then picks a part of the world we operate in and then talks about where he sees the risk is. And we use these mechanisms and SWOT analysis to come up with a list of vulnerabilities we believe affects us. And, and this is the hard part, Eric. What we have to do is based on the, all the noise. And this is the important part. This noise is coming from expert. People really understand technology, but maybe not my company. So they are telling us the right things. And we are sitting there listing out all the things that's going in the world trying to make sense of it, then end up prioritizing based on uh, simple concepts of uh, workload security. And like one of the things I would say is, as a sandstone company, we at very early on, when we got onto our ISO processes, we define what's most important to the company, uh, whether it's the IP, the digital assets, or the data. And it turns out our workload security was the top most priority for us, as in the data was the most important thing. And that means is the mechanism we picked up is a quite well-known CIA mechanism, which looks at the confidentiality of data, integrity of the data and availability. And we use that mechanism to prioritize risks to say, if it affects any one of these, then it's really on the higher priority. If it does not affect CIA, we then deprioritize it. 
And, and that's something we had to work based on our knowledge, our customer needs and our management and companies' willingness to spend money or fix bugs and the, the speed with which move. We ended up coming with the metrics that cybersecurity team maintains. And based on that, now we provide context to the rest of the organization about how fast or how quickly the vulnerability needs to be, uh, you know, uh, patched, fixed, or taken out of the stack based on how it impacts the workload. Well, thank you so much, Chai, for sharing your experience uh, and these stories with us. Uh, that's great context with respect to how a uh, how an organization has to deal with visibility and risk assessment. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. And as I always said, it's always a pleasure having these conversations with you.